When I started school, I couldn't speak a word of English. The word español, right? Because sí. that's what I grew up with. Yeah. By the time I got out, I couldn't speak Spanish. It turns out that Cesar Chavez, when he was 16 years old, used to run around with my primo, who was 19, dressed up in zoot suits. Ah. <laughs> Cesar Chavez was a zoot suiter. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> there are these great photographs of us on stage with a black beret and huarachis uh. <laughs> standing next to the Kennedys. They actually shopped it around and went to different studios and talked to different, and nobody wanted to touch it. Because of the, there's a lot of politics behind the story of Richie Valens that we discovered along the way. I felt that we owed him at least the story to be told from his point of view. The research began. Yeah. It took 13 years for me to figure it out and I ended up finding out his name was Ricardo Valenzuela. One of the first artists I can remember besides Selena dated back and then Santana was Richie. Right. Richie was probably the first Latino to break through in mainstream media, musically. Exactly. One thing you had mentioned is that a lot of people know Richie's mom is actually in, makes the cameo in the, the movie, movie, right? In the movie. Uh, yeah, there's a scene in there where Richie's sitting on my lap and we're both playing the same guitar. Yeah. And there's a woman sitting right to our right, dressed in white, and that's Richie's mom. They were with us the entire 47 days of the shoot. They were present through every day of the shoot. And some of those days started at five in the morning, they were there and grabbed Lou Diamond Phillips and said, why did you get on that plane? All this stuff, it was a catharsis that was taking place. And actually, uh, we, we had another ending. I realized in Hollywood right away that uh, we had to carve our way in. Nobody was gonna let us in, we had to come, we had to beat the door down, you know? So much talent in our neighborhoods, yeah. in, our, in, our, in our barrios. When we create our stories, when we tell our stories, we have to cast our own people. It has to be brown made per se, one from the from the beginning to the end. Latinos need to understand, in order for Hollywood to recognize who we are, they have to understand the economic validity of our audience and the fact that our people are willing to spend money. It's beginning to happen, right? Uh, but it's taking years, yeah, man. Right. The future is really important in terms of where yeah. we go from here, you know? Now that we've got our foot in the door, yeah. it's the question of what happens from here on out. And exactly. a lot of it has to do with the kind of stories that we tell. We need to focus on ourselves and we need to tell our own stories. ¿Qué tal amigos de Spanglish? Bienvenido a otro episodio. Antes de iniciar, recuerde que nos puede encontrar por todas las plataformas digitales, Spotify, Apple Music y por supuesto Amazon Music. Y claro, en YouTube, recuerde que también nos puede encontrar por redes sociales en Instagram como, como Spanglish Podcast. Hoy tenemos un invitado muy especial y lo que se considera para mucha gente una leyenda. Tenemos al actor, productor, escritor, músico y por supuesto uno de los mejores eh, personas para contar historias, Daniel Valdés Cabero. Muy buenas tardes, ¿cómo está? Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Gracias por acompañarnos. Este, before we get started, cuéntenos un poquito de dónde es, where are you from, de dónde vienen sus, sus padres, uh, para iniciar. Well, my, my family is originally from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we're, we're farm workers, you know, migrants, and uh, my family came to California in the early 40s. Uh, but they spent the first few years of their lives together, my mom and dad, in in uh, Arizona. My mother is from Caborca, she's a Yaqui. Yeah. You know, I'm a Yaqui. Yeah. And my dad was born in Douglas. So they met when they were very young and uh, they lived in Tucson, Arizona. And in about 1935, they moved to California looking for work, right? And also they want to get out of the heat. Mm. Uh, consequently, they, our family moved to California and we started working the fields, right? And that's where all of us were born. I come from a family of 10, there's five brothers and five sisters. You know, it was really advantageous to have un fregatar de, de chavalos to go out to the fields, right? It was an army of kid pickers, right? Yeah. So uh, we spent our lives really going from, from town to town, right? Uh, Actually, I, I remember on my, my childhood was kind of funny because I didn't spend too much time in one particular place because we were constantly moving. We were living in Delano, California, right, where a lot of our family is still there. And uh, what ended up happening is we were, we were migrating up to Northern California to the Santa Clara Valley to pick prunes and pick grapes. And so every year we would, would go there to, to do work. Um, in one of those years, se, se me fregó la troca a mi papá. And so we had to stay and we lived inside an orchard in an army tent, right? And that's where I, Yeah, so, and that's where I started school. Wow. 
So when I started school, I couldn't speak a word of English. To put español, right? Because sí. that's what I grew up with. Yeah. By the time I got out, I couldn't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it took, it took 16 years for them to wipe my head clean. Right, right. But so I grew up as an urban really a figure, you know, and, and watching the urbanization of San Jose take place because it was mainly a, 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 an agricultural place, a poor field, you know. Mm. Uh, and so we spent the early part of our lives from the 50s into the 60s working in these ranchos around San Jose, constantly coming back to the valley to visit our, our families, right? Uh, and in the process, this man named Cesar Chavez, right, decided to go ahead and start a strike. Right. Well, I found out years later there was a connection between my family and Cesar Chavez. It turns out that Cesar Chavez, when he was 16 years old, used to run around with my primo, who was 19, dressed up in zoot suits. Ah. <laughs> Cesar Chavez was a zoot suiter. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Nobody does. You know, there are these incredible photographs of Cesar Chavez with my cousin dressed up in the zoot suits, you know. And, uh, of course, he, uh, Cesar was still, he was dating Helen, his, who became his wife. Mm -hmm. So there was a connection there. And I found out from Cesar, Cesar years later, through a story that I, I, I'll get to that one, but mm -hmm. he was telling my son that he used to come and hang out in my grandmother's house and my mom's house, right? Mm -hmm. And my primos were there and they, they were coming to eat tortillas. Se comían todos los tortillas. So my mother always knew him as a tragón. Venía a comer toda la comida. And uh, so there was a connection there. I didn't realize it was there. So when I went back to Delano in 1965, 66, yeah. I was 17 years old. I just got out of high school. Right. Uh, I had been a troublesome juvenile delinquent up mm -hmm. to that point giving my, my mother and father a lot of headaches, you know, and they were very concerned that I was going to end up in jail, which I almost did. You know, I was, I was running around with a lot, of, a lot of bad people. So she said, you need to go away. You need to go grow up somewhere. And uh, the Teatro Campesino had just started. It was just, it was just a small group. And uh, they had come to my mom's house for Christmas. And uh, this one particular member, his name was uh, Felipe Cantu, who was... 37 years, 47 years old, he had eight kids. He was one of the members of the teatro. Right? He happened to be one of the actual scabs in one of the fields that we actually got out and he joined the teatro, right? He sat me down and he said, that's horas tiempo, es el hombre, right? He said, vente conmigo, vamos, vamos para terreno. I, I want to go back to the valley. Yeah. You know, I was an urban kid. Right? Yeah. What am I going to do in the fields, right? Uh, <laughs> so I consented to go and spend three weeks with my brother who hadn't, I hadn't seen in 10 years. Wow. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the process, his life had totally changed. He went to San Jose State. He got politicized, became a playwright. He went to Cuba in 1963. 63, there are actual photographs of Fidel Castro and Che with my brother <laughs> playing baseball. Right? Wow. <laughs> so he comes back to San Jose State, now he's a rebel. Yeah. Right. He graduates and he decides he's going to move his career into the into theater. He ended up joining the San Francisco meme troupe and worked with the meme troupe for over about a year. And then he got this calling to go to Delano to help Cesar Chavez build the union. Wow. Your brother. So, yeah. So he went there and in the first six months and we were getting news about his, his, his exploits in Delano through our family because a lot of the ranches that they were picketing were ranches where our family was actually working. My, my Theo was one of the contractors that got picketed, that got hit with the huelga during that whole period. So he called my mother up and says, ¿Qué está haciendo este mujer? He's like, <laughs> me, 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 está fregando he's, todo. he's ruining everything. Yeah. So it was this funny thing that was wow. taking place. So I vamos, I, on Christmas, I said, okay, vamos. I took my guitar and I went. Right. With the idea that I would be there for two or three weeks at the most, I never came back. Wow. I ended up staying. Yeah, and so my life evolved and totally changed. And uh, next thing I know, we're we're on a national tour. Yeah. And uh, we went to the Newport Folk Festival in 1969. 69. We were invited to the Newport Folk Festival. And that was in Rhode Island, right? Yeah. Monstrous festival. Judy Collins, Theodore Bikel, Judy Collins, the Cambridge Brothers, Saple Sisters. I mean, there were all these great performers. Outer Guthrie and the Teatro. 
the theater was invited to come. Biggest in. ones. Yeah, we're coming for. <laughs> so I almost in our van all, you know, squeezed into our van, six or seven of us with props and everything. I, I was told, come on a piece guy. <laughs> we went to, to Rhode Island and uh, performed. And the amazing thing was that there was 83,000 people there the night that we performed. Uh, it was it was a mind bending absolute. The whole tour was amazing. It was it was a three and a half month tour that took us from Rhode Island, went to New York, and we're at the the Village Theater in New York, and we were a big hit because it just turns out there was a labor strike taking place between the the workers from the social department. The social workers were fighting against the employees. They came to our show. There must have been two thousand people. And Sagarraban in the middle of the show, oh, they were screaming at each other. Literally, the the, the manager was was up in the balcony, and, <laughs> and yeah. And so we had to stop the show right in the middle of our show about hermanos, hermanos. No, 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 tranquilo, tranquilo. <laughs> so we went from New York. We got a lot of attention. Uh, it turns out that uh, Newsweek magazine came and caught us performing. They were amazed by our show. And so they wrote a story about the Teatro Campesino being in New York. Uh, we were in Greenwich Village, right? And then we were invited to go to Washington, D.C. because we had been invited to perform in the House of Representatives in Washington because Hubert Humphrey, who was running for president, invited the Teatro to come and perform. Wow. So there we were, and we stayed at the Watergate Hotel. It was crazy. Crazy. It's really crazy. A, bu a bunch of kids from the, from the field. Yeah. 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 So we, we performed. There was a group, a subcommittee of migratory labor, they called it. There were five senators, the Kennedys, Senator Yarborough, Senator Williams, and they were our hosts. And so we performed in the quad at the House of Representatives in the open. And, and of course, they were amazed, right? But they were really rooting before the theater and the fact that the union was making so much impressions, right? There are these great photographs of us on stage. I'm on stage, I'm 17 years old, with a black beret in Huarachis, <laughs> <laughs> standing next to the Kennedys. There you go. Right? So we, we were there for a week, I think, in, in, in Washington. Then we went on to go to Detroit. On our way to Detroit, the National Guard was on the freeway stopping all the traffic because it was on fire. The riots had broken out. And so we were detoured and we were sent to Chicago. We went to Chicago performing St. Mary's Church. And we went back to Detroit because we couldn't mess up the, the performance schedule right. and performed in Detroit. The fires were still going, the riots were still happening. Then we went to Omaha, Nebraska. We were in Omaha and we started touring our way back. We ended up in Denver, hosted by the crusade of for justice, Corky Gonzalez. Corky. And that's where we first met. And we became a family here. In, 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 it was a big deal for the Teatro de And this is my first year, me being there. Wow. Right? Long story short, the following year, we were in Europe. I got to go to Paris. I turned 18 in Paris. Yeah, we performed in the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, this, this great playwright, uh, Antonio Bunuel, I think was his name. Uh, hosted us there. So we performed there was 2,000 people in this beautiful, beautiful theater. Uh, and then we started picking up performances. We we're at the University of Fresnes, which is at the, the bottom area of Paris. And uh, so we were in Paris for about three weeks. Uh, and that was our first contact with the international audience. Uh, and again, it was the Teatro Campesino. You know, we didn't know whether we were going to find an audience or not. Well, the French embraced us and especially the working class, because we ended up performing for the, the Peugeot workers in a factory outside of, uh, yeah, and there were like 2,000 workers. And, you know, our, our teatro used these cardboard signs with the names of the characters on this. And we have the three characters, the, the uh, archetypes that we use, the patron, el patroncito y el trabajador, right? And so what we did, we translated the, the signs into French and did our show and they went crazy. They loved us, man. And amazing how the French embraced us because they didn't see us as anything else but Chicanos. They saw us as Latinos 
And they, talk, they talked about us as being the Mexique, right? the Estados Unidos, right? Yeah. And we were the Mexicans from the United States. The Mexicans from the United yeah, States. Yeah, the, the, the Chabot, you know, Pancho Villa, they say, and, you know, <laughs> it was an incredible embrace. That's beautiful. Absolutely incredible. But the political exchange was incredible. That's beautiful. Came back to the U.S. and it's been growing ever since. You know, we came back to Delano. Uh, the following year, we moved to Fresno in that area, uh, to a little town called Del Rey, California. Uh, where actually the teatro really started to evolve. Up to that point, the teatro campesino had been basically a rural, a rural group, which really appealing to the farm workers. And we were somewhat bilingual, but more, more, more Mexicano than anything else. He, being in Fresno, new, uh, new uh, issues started to come up. We wanted to talk about the Vietnam War, and it was very touchy because the union kept saying, well, we have met made a stand on the union on the war yet so if you guys want to do stuff outside of the union then you have to stand on your own to do it or so we don't embarrass the union right, right. so that's why we went to del rey uh we started performing and my brother started teaching at fresno state on the first chicano class in 1969 right? 69 to 70 and it urbanized our company wow we started getting actors from Fresno who were ex-students of Fresno State. It changed our group. It changed our plays. We went from doing 10-minute actos to doing 20-minute skits or longer. It started to become play format. And then we started to do full, full performances of plays. Uh, it was a very important time for us because it was a, an evolution of, of the company that was growing. Anyway, that led to another thing, you know, and we ended up moving to San Juan Bautista in the early 70s. I met my wife at actually the performance at San Jose State. Mm. She was one of the students there. It was a commencement day, you know, and the Teatro Campesino was, was performing. performing. And I saw her in the audience. I said, you, you, you're the <laughs> one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like a yeah, so I chased her and I finally got her to commit that she's, she'd go out with me. Uh, I, we fell in love. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this, we, st we immediately, immediately started really gravitating towards each other. She moved to Fresno with me. She lived with me for a few weeks. And then we decided to go back to San Jose because her family was there. Uh, and uh, we started our family. And uh, we had our first born in 1970, uh, Emiliano. And uh, it turns out that we're still touring. We got another call to go back to Paris or go back to France. So I took my son with me. He was a year and a half years old. We put him on this plane with wow. us. <laughs> it's always been that way. So our life has been constantly evolving artistically. Uh, because of the teatro, you know, we started performing on television. We, I remember a very special performance that we did for Channel 4, KNTV, uh, no, uh, Channel 4, I forget the name of the company, uh, in Los Angeles who sponsored us in one of the performances. And at the time, the biggest attraction were these Latin actors. Well, it was Ricardo Montalban, oh. it's Anthony Quinn. Yeah. Uh, they were these. They hosted us. Right. They hosted a big dinner for us, right? Uh, Gilbert Rowland. These were these were the Hollywood were Latino the guys back stars. Then. Yeah. yeah. They saw us coming up, and they said, "You know, we want to sit down with you guys." So they had this dinner for us, and I just remember flipping nuts, looking at, staring at. Anthony Quinn, man, I was like, wow, Jesus, this guy's real, you know? Yeah. And they- Starstruck. Yeah, yeah. They sit there and tell us, you know how important you guys are? The, the weight of responsibility that you guys have to represent our people and how difficult it is in Hollywood to get any kind of recognition for our work. And be careful because you'll end up being stereotyped. Yeah. Right? I mean, this was them telling us, right? And here we were performing the teatro and they, they encouraged us to keep performing, but they said, beware of what's coming. Because they knew success was coming. We had no idea that that little, that little show that we did was going to launch a whole career into movies, you know, and television, you know. I mean, we ended up doing a lot of television specials uh, and uh, one of them won a, an actual award it was, uh, that was done, that we did there. and. Uh, it was amazing how embracing the, the whole the whole 
the whole population of the industry was embracing the, the theater in terms of every performance. But we started realizing that we were into this business of theater and movies. And so our dreams and our hopes were to go on to something else and bigger, right? right. Uh, in 1979 and 78, we got invited to a festival at the Market Perform in Los Angeles. They were holding the theater festival from all over the country and they were bringing in groups. They did this for 10 days, right? And the theater was invited to come and perform. And we were commissioned to write a, an original piece about Los Angeles. So Zoot Suit was born, right? Because it took place in Los Angeles. The story of 22 young Chicanos that were, were railroaded and were sent to prison. Right. And I little do we know that there are connections of people all over the place. It turns out the Sleepy Lagoon murder case and the committee to support the lawyers who were representing them were being funded by people like Rita Hayworth, Anthony Quinn, Gilbert Rowland. And here were these people that we had met years before who were involved politically in this event that took place in the 1942. Yeah. So there was these tremendous connections. It's all this connection. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's amazing. Anyway, I'll go on forever. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, just to, I, we're, we're definitely, we want to dive into that, just uh, the whole thing about zoo suits. Um, but just to backtrack a little bit, because aparte de, de, del teatro, I wanted to touch on how great you are musically. Uh, de donde nació, I guess, this passion for music and, and how that led into this, I mean, further down on it, like in the 70s into the Mestizo, which was, Right. An amazing album. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was I learned to teach. I taught myself how to play a guitar. Right. I, I had this. Amp. I've always had this thing about being a musician. And it turns out that I'm fourth generation, fifth generation musician in my family. Um, my my grandfather used to play, and so my uncle also played. My mother and father used to sing on the radio, right. so it, the music was always there. And I had this inkling to want to become. A, a singer, right? Uh, in the second grade, uh, I was Elvis Presley. <laughs> I came out and did a lip sync. You know, and my brother painted the, the palacas on me. And I came out and did the number, right? Yeah. So, man, pegó, man. I got to love the idea of the audience. So, that's where it was born. Okay. Because, I mean, later, further down the line, obviously, you, you came out with the, the album Mestizo. Um, and that also led you to perform with some amazing acts to this day, right? Some legends on stage. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, 73. I did the, the album with a &M Records, and uh, it was a result of Herb Alpert, who was the A in a &M, a m right? Okay. Yeah, their name is Moss. It's just Albert and Moss. Oh, okay. That's how you get a &M. Okay. They were a big company, and they were, had a lot of hits at the time. I had done a special for KCET, which is a PBS station. We did a, a live simulcast broadcast of a concert where we brought an audience in and they shot it right and it, it aired it was a special kind of airing because you could turn the sound down on your tv and turn up your radio and hear it in stereo wow it was a big deal wow. it was the beginning of, of midnight special mm -hmm. that's where midnight special was born so it aired we got tremendous response people really loved it but there was a guy named herb Albert who happened to be watching he saw the performance and he said I want this guy on the label. Wow. So the next thing I know, I get a, I get a phone call saying A and M Records wants to sign you. So one thing led to another. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was funny. First, first Chicano album. Yes, first Chicano album on in 1973, and the only on a major the only label. only other Chicano act was Chichen Chong, yeah. who we'd become friends with in yeah. 1972. Yeah. So we hit it off. We were close, very close. We were the only Chicanos on the label. Yeah. Uh, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a really important time, but that's where I started meeting some incredible people. You you, know? you, you've been on stage with Santana, with yeah, uh, Linda. Yeah. Tell me how you crossed paths with uh, Linda. Linda. Linda actually was a very special kind of a person. You know, We kind of look at each other as, as family because uh, our history kind of goes back. It turns out that Linda's godfather, Lalo Guerrero, who is my dad's second cousin, is also a tremendous writer. He wrote tremendous songs. And, uh, he baptized Linda, right? And he, so he was his godfather. Brother. Well, there was like it's this funny, funny family connection. Linda and I finally hooked up in uh, 1979, 780, when we screened the uh, 
the we had the, the premiere of Zoot Suit at the Cinema Dome in in Los Angeles, and uh, after after the performance, we were I was being mobbed by the by the paparazzi, and so they led me into a room where I could hide, <laughs> and Linda was in there, and we we finally met face to face. You know, uh, we established, established a strong friendship relation right away, and. Uh, we said someday we'll get a chance to work together, you know. And uh, years later, I mean, this was 1981. You know, I get this call from Linda saying, "I'm working on this. I want to do this Mexican album. You know, will you help me?" And I had convinced her to try and work with me on a, another piece prior to that, where we were doing a special theatrical piece for uh, KQED in Los Angeles, and uh, I said, "Would you be willing to sing one of the songs for our show?" Right? which was a long shot, I didn't think she would do it. She said, yeah, I'll do it. So she came and I got to work with her because I was, I was the musical director. And so a strong musical relationship started. Yeah. And we, she ended up performing in the piece. Uh, we ended up performing about five different musical pieces, songs that we sang uh, in the show. And what we both realized is that we worked together really well yeah. and our voices blended really well. Right. So as a result, she said, look, I want to do this album, you know, and I need help. I want you to help me if you can, you know, and uh, I said, yes, I'm more than willing to do that. So we ended up working together, rehearsing for the album. And uh, we started off by doing uh, in these little fundraiser performances in different places, right? Blasi de Domingo actually hosted us in, in one of his shows and we were able to perform together and we ended up on the Johnny Carson show on the Tonight Show performing the piece that we did for cameras in 19, in, in, in the Q, KQED. And that's the song that ended up on the album. Wow. Um, and she wanted to recreate this photograph, which was, which came from a Mexican, Mexican calendar actually, yeah. right? Yeah. And she said, I want you to be the guy. Yeah. So. We set it up and I'm standing behind her and she's sitting in front. And yes. Like yeah. <laughs> so Cancion de Mi Padre was born. Yeah. Right? And uh, we went to Cuernavaca, rehearsed for three weeks. Uh, we worked with the mariachi there and the incredible mariachi. Uh, we had some great people. And then we started our tour. We did 11 cities, uh, 52 cities, 11 months. 11 months. Yeah. So, so a short one. Yeah. Short tour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it, we worked together for a while and uh, we stayed in contact. We wanted to do more, but she got busy doing other things just as I was there. Uh, and we, we continue to stay close to each other. I recently recorded a piece for her birthday last year, actually this year, uh, with David Algo from Los Lobos. Yeah. And there's another group called Los Sisisontes from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And we we're in the middle of COVID. And so they said, do you, we want to do this song for Linda, which she wrote with her dad in the 1973. She put it on the Art, 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 Art Like a Wheel album, only it was some white guy that sang with her, <laughs> right? And the song was in Spanish, but so it kind of weird, you know, she didn't really like it that much. Right. So we said, well, for her birthday, we're gonna record the song. So we did a three-part harmony, and we did it long distance because I made my track down, sent to LA, and then went back to Berkeley, we finally put it together, and then we shot the video. It's on YouTube, you mm -hmm. can actually see it. Uh, we give it to her for her birthday. Yeah, so she That's was amazing. <laughs> she was really That's taken. That's amazing. <laughs> and then, obviously, the, that you had great musical success, and then uh, Zoo Suit, the play comes out, and then that later gets turned into a movie. I mean, for me, I'm a little bit younger than you. Sure. Um, the uh, growing up, I remember the first few times that I saw brown actors and, and, and authentic, what felt to me was authentic brown storytelling was with Suit Suits. Um, and it was, uh, it was you guys, it was a few of you guys, it was Edward James Olmos with uh, Selena and obviously um, Mi Familia, uh, Cheech and Chon, obviously uh, Born in East LA, which you were also in. Mm -hmm. But one of those movies that I, that I remember seeing growing up was La Bamba. Yeah. La Bamba was one of those ones that also historically brown film that felt really authentic and touched home for a lot of kids my age. It was the first time seeing brown actors and brown storytelling and a lot of the things that we could relate to in our language, you know what I mean? And, and speaking Spanglish, you know, right. speaking, going back and forth with Chinese Spanish. 
how did that how did that project come about and, and what was the what was this urge to to tell the story of of, well, of Richie, Ricardo? Richie was one of my heroes. And so when I was I was 11 or 12 years old when he died. And I remember the t this term that they used, the late great Richie Valens, right? That was the the disc jockeys would use and talk about how sad it was that he died because he was only 17 years old. And he was part of you know, the day the music died, yeah, you know, you had Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper, but you never really heard anything about Richie Valens, you know. He, he permeated my life in one form or another. As, as I got older, I became a teenager because I started playing music. I think my first band was, I was 16 years old. Uh, out of high school, I remember they were playing, a lot of his music was on the radio, on the top 10 uh, lists, you know, and, uh, I was really impressed with how powerful his music was. And it always stayed in the back of my mind. So in 73, when we did the Mestizo, mm -hmm. my producer, Taylor Hatford, who ended up being our executive producer on the film, he was my business manager in 73. Yeah. <laughs> uh, had, we had this idea to try and do the Richie Valen story. I was gonna play Richie, I was 23 years old. So I said, I'm ready, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so we tr actually shopped it around and went to different studios and talked to different and nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody wanted to even think about funding it, right? What do you think that was? Because of the, there's a lot of politics behind the story of Richie Valens that we discovered along the way. Uh, because he was 17 years old, he died in this plane crash, but by law, he should have had a chaperone with him because yeah. he was 17. Andres. Well, Dick Clark, Dick Clark Productions were the producers of that tour. So there's a lot of legal things go taking place that really prevented anybody from telling the story. They didn't want people to know how young he was. Yeah. And on top of the fact that his, his manager, Bob Keen, controlled everything that Richie did. And this guy even went to the point where he started putting his name on Richie's music. He was sharing his his name and he had he had legal right to some of the songs that he wrote. I mean, and he was exploiting Richie beyond belief, you know. And uh, I found this out along the way. Yeah. When we did Zoot Suit in New York, we're on Broadway. Uh, my brother and I had had a lot of these discussions and these dreams that we had of doing musicals. And we had talked about doing the Richie Valens story, but you know, never had a chance really to think about how we were gonna do it. It wasn't until Zoot Suit, because of Zoot Suit and the, the notoriety that Zoot Suit brought and the fact that we were able to get into Hollywood, it gave us the opportunity to maybe do something new. We asked in my dressing room, I remember he said, what do you wanna do next? I said, let's do the Richie Valens story. He said, how are we gonna do that? I said, I don't know yet, but <laughs> figure out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, you know, I felt personally indebted to Richie. I felt that we owed him at least the story to be told from his point of view. So the research began. Yeah. It took 13 years for me to figure it out. And I ended up finding out his name was Ricardo Venezuela and his family was from Pacoima. And I mean, you talk about divine intervention. I mean, it turns out his family lived 16 miles away from me in Watsonville. Yeah. It was crazy, man. It was really crazy. So. We got to be friends with the family. And it took me five years to convince them to let me try and do the story. Um, and at that point, we had a lot of interest. You know, Taylor Hackford, I tell you, my friend, who now had become a golden boy in Hollywood. He, he had Academy Awards, like you couldn't believe. And uh, I told him, I, I have Richie's family. He said, he said, what? <laughs> he says, yes, I have Richie's family. He said, okay, let's just do this, let's, let's knock it down, right? So we started negotiations with the family and we had to get into the reality of Richie's life, which was complicated because a lot of legal things were taking place. Uh, the family wasn't doing very well. Uh, they were living in this little ranch in, in Watsonville and uh, they, were, they were basically um, Mexicanos, fact Mexican families living, struggling, trying to stay alive. Connie, Richie's mom, you know, the matriarch of the family, uh, kept everybody together. Uh, she enshrined Richie. You know, there was always a shrine. And as a matter of fact, I went to her house and on the wall, you know, there was a tremendous shrine to Richie. So, but I, I felt the 30 years of pain in that family 
the, the sisters and the brothers talked about losing their brother, you know. So it became a personal thing with me. And I ended up really becoming part of the family. Yeah. Uh, we finally got a chance to sit down with the Hollywood people and explain to them it was a complicated story to tell because there were a lot of legal problems, you know. Mainly, there was no control over the music because the, 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 guy, the producer owned it. Yeah. And so the family had story rights, but there was no music rights. You can't tell the story of Richie Valens without music. Well, again, divine intervention. Turns out in 1959, the copyright laws changed from 1959 to 1960. In 59, up to that point, a copyright was only good for 25 years. You had to renew it every 25 years. Right. In 1960, it changed to the life of the artist plus 50. So we caught it just as it changed over. And what happened was the rendering re reissuing came up right around the time we were working on the film. Perfect. So we convinced the family not to re-sign with the, with the producer. Right. And they were concerned because they they never experienced anything like that. Yeah. We told them it's going to change your whole life. Yeah. So we got 100% of that publishing back to the family, which changed everything for the family. Yes. And we, we gave percentage points to the family. So they had a piece of the movie. They were involved with the movie from the day one. I mean, all the way up to the premiere. I mean, even Connie won on the Today Show. Yeah. She was on a national tour. <laughs> talking about Richie, but the uh, Lamba was was something else, man. It was it was it was an incredible incredible event. I want to speak on the movie because it's it's such a legendary movie, and I think the whole process, how you said it was, it's a lot of people don't know how many years it took to create that movie. I think for a lot of us, uh, one of the characters besides Richie, obviously. Uh, that was incredible and that always stood out was because of his style and his persona was uh, Rich's uh, brother, Bob. Yeah. Um, how did you be, how did you meet Bob or how did you finally get him to come along to, well, to, to finally was, be a part of the movie? It was because of Bob that a lot of this happened, you know. I happened to meet Bob and his brother Mario uh, one night when I was rehearsing, when I was researching the project and I still wasn't sure who was what, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in San Juan Bautista who was a bartender at the bar there. And it was Halloween night and uh, everybody in town knew I was working on the, on the Richie Valens project. I was gonna do it as a musical, right? I, I mean, the idea of doing a film wasn't there yet. And so I get this phone call in the middle of 11 o'clock at night and she says, listen, you need to come over here because there's two guys here who say they're Richie Valens' brothers. I said, no, but there's no way. That's it. You know, they're probably some phony guy. You know, guy had run people saying, yeah, he's my cousin. You know, I, but never anything real. And so, I could not let it go. I said, I got out of bed and I said, I got, I got, I got to go. I got to go. Yeah. So I went and I met these two guys, these two bikers, Bob and Mario. These long hair, right? and they're sitting there and they said, okay, we heard you were looking for us. Why do you want to do this? What do you want with my brother? So, and why do you want to do this? So I said, and I told him, look, I'm an actor. I'm a film producer. I want to do the story of your brother because I think he's important. He's important to the whole, to all, to all of us. And they said, yeah, well, we've heard a lot of that before. You know, it turns out they've been ripped off a lot. So there was a lot of animosity there in terms of trusting anybody. We talked for a good half hour you know, and they said, you know, why do you want to do this? I said, because it's important. I said, your brother is an icon and he cracked the ceiling on rock and roll music. He, he is uh, identifying with the first contribution of Chicanos into the national stream and left a mark, a, a rock and roll mark that it never could go away. And I said, and aside from the fact that he was only 17 years old, and nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows who Valens was. His actual name. Valenzuela. Yeah. So they listened and they said, okay. They said, we'll be in touch. Yeah, Ivan, you know. I said, well, who knows if they're real or yeah. not, yeah. you know. Two weeks later, I get a knock on the door in my house, at my house. I open the door and there's, there's Bob, Mario, and Connie. Mom. Which is mom yeah. standing in my door. Wow. 
And they it came in and that's where it began. That's where it actually began. That's where it started. And I think that the beauty in that, uh, Don Daniel, is, is when we think of Chicanos or Mexican Americans in, in, in this country, um, there's been very few artists. Now, obviously, there's a lot, right? Now in, in mainstream media. But one of the first artists that I can remember, besides Selena, dated back, and then Santana, was Richie. Right. Richie was probably the first Latino to break through in mainstream media, musically. Exactly. Yeah, so that, that, that alone was incredible. Speaking on the movie, what I found interesting was also the that Richie's mom, the scene where she says that she's, she's also Yaki. Yes. That's, which was in, incredible. So that that was his bloodline as well. Yes, it's her connection, right? Yeah. And they were farm workers. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that's, I, that's probably why they, they family felt okay with trusting us, you know? Uh, there was a little unsureness because we were Hollywood to a certain extent, right? But we didn't look Hollywood. So the one thing I think it convinced Connie was that we were a family and they found out who my brother was. And I brought my brother into the picture and things started to happen, right? And uh, yeah, and of course, the first thing I did was I called my friend Taylor Hafford and said, we want to do this movie. And he said, yeah, let's, let's get the family to sign. So. I spent the five years trying to convince him to finally they said, let's do it. do it, let's do it. But it was Bob who was the, really the, the, the spearhead Spirit, yeah. Yeah, and that helped us push this thing through. So he was, he was along for the whole process. One of the, the scenes that are really famous in that movie is, is that those dreams that, that Rich was at, was that a real thing when he would picture the, the, the yeah. plane falling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 As his friend got killed. It was an actual event that took place in one of the one of the local elementary schools which he was going to, uh, and he happened to be at a funeral the day that the planes crashed right over the, the play yard and killed his best friend. Wow. And he would have been there. Yeah, that's what his what his nightmare was about. Yeah. That's why he didn't want to get on a plane. Yeah, he had this thing about planes, you know. Uh, but it's, it was an amazing thing, man. He's he was 16 years old yeah. when this when this thing took off. Yeah. He ended up on the American Bandstand show with national inter national exposure. This was only eight months after signing. Yes, it, it just blew up. It blew up. It blew up. Yeah. So I can't imagine what it, his head was going through because he was 17 years old, dealing with success beyond anything we will ever experience. Yeah. He was on tour in New York, <clears throat> going cross country and being on the American Bandstand show mm -hmm. and having a number one hit. Yeah. It was number one. Yeah. Nationally. He pushed that King Cole off the charts and took the number one position. O'Donna was the number one hit in the country. 17-year-old yeah. Chicano kid. Man. Yeah. So, wow. That's incredible. And I, and I think that speaks to, to his greatness and why I appreciate you and, and your brother. Quickly, just to speak on the, the, the cameos, I think one thing you had mentioned is that a lot of people know Richie's mom is actually in, makes the cameo in the, the movie, movie, right? She's in the movie. Uh, yeah, there's a scene in there where Richie's sitting on my lap and we're both playing the same guitar. Yeah. And there's a woman sitting right to our right, dressed in white, and that's Richie's mom. And the, the two sisters also show up there in that party scene. Bob is in the scene and uh, you can see in that party scene, you can see- all In the living room. The, yeah, all the members of the family are in there, you know, and- uh, it was wonderful having that family with us. I mean, it was just great because it was a very emotional thing. Just the first time we screened the film, we screened it for the family. And it was like tearing something out of your guts, man, because they were reliving, losing him, right? So it was tremendous emotion that it happened. And so I I was sitting with Connie and I said, go on to Sientes. She said, algo pasó aquí que es muy importante. You know, and she, she was overwhelmed. She said, finally, the pain had been lifted. She could finally die, she said. Ahora si me puedo morir. Ya cumplí. You know, and it stayed with me the whole time, you know. And so I stayed very close with Connie throughout this whole process. And they were with us the entire 47 days of the shoot. They were present through every day of the shoot. You know, and some of those days started at five in the morning and they were there. You know, and uh, I mean, that scene where Richie Connie gets the news that Richie was killed. We had Connie sitting in the corner and she grabbed her heart. And so the crew was freaking out because 
we were going to have a heart attack right on our stage, you know, and we had to move her away because it was too heavy. And in the scene where Blue Diamond Phillips walks up to get on the plane, the two sisters who were nine and seven years old when Richie died, got up and walked into the scene while the cameras were rolling and grabbed Blue Diamond Phillips and said, why did you get on that plane? Why did you get on that plane? They, it's got a real man. And it was real. It was real. I mean, we all witnessed the fact that they were reliving all this stuff. It was a catharsis that was taking place. So, I mean, the film, what it meant to them was so very important because America finally said, look, we embrace your son. We recognize who he is and we give you our love and our support. And that made all the difference in the world. You know, finally, six months later, you know, Connie calls me up in the middle of the night. She goes, yeah, my boy. I said, where are you going? She goes, yeah, yeah, we're going Richie. Hmm. She died next morning. Yeah, six months later. Yeah. After the movie. After the movie. I think that for anyone that's seen the movie, which we all have, it's it's it speaks to how authentic it felt. And yeah. I think that I now that the understanding that the family was so involved and that's why it felt so real because I put us anecdotas yeah. que, que um you're telling us from from meeting Bob to the family being at the shoot to uh the just the famous scene in the living room where where they're partying and and that they're actually in it they were they were very much involved throughout the whole process so that's why the the it must have felt so real for them and it must have been reliving the whole thing yeah it definitely relived it so was was a lot of the, like the was the coin flip the 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 yes buddy holly that was a real thing it was real yeah it was uh, tommy Alsap, who was the guitar player for, for willie nelson was on the tour and uh he was the one who flipped the coin with Richie, and Richie, Richie won. Yeah. You know, and it was because Richie had the flu; he was sick, really sick. You know, and and the the heater had broken down on the bus, so they were getting frostbite <laughs> on their feet and their, on their hands. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they were on their way to uh, their next show. You know, and uh, the idea of Buddy Holly came up with the idea of charting the plane and going to the next gig so they could be there in time to wash their clothes and take a little, little time to sleep. But otherwise, they were going to be in that bus another 27 hours. So Richie said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. He didn't, he didn't think he was going to win the toss. You know, and he won the toss. But the phone call ahead of time, the phone call between Bob and Richie was real. Was it, that was a real thing? It was a real to thing. To call and make up for the fight? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's why I said we're, we're pulling stuff out of reality. Yeah. You know, this is real stuff that happened. You know, we didn't have to make it up. I think one of the most famous scenes in, in, in movies is is that that scene where he screams out, where Bob screams out uh, Richie's name. And um, where'd you, where was that shot on that famous hill where they had like that flashback, they're running up the hill. And... The scene where you see Richie in the garage plane. Yeah. That's the area where we shot the, it was in, uh, was it in New Hall? New Hall, uh, right outside of LA. Mm. Uh, it's right, right, right outside of Pacoima. And it's an old barrio, you know, and uh, we picked it because the garage was so beat up. We wanted to shoot the scene there. Well, right next to it was the river and the bridge. Yeah. And uh, the cinematographer said, we gotta come back here gotta and, and shoot that, that scene. That, that, that scene is so And actually, you know, we, we had another ending. Really? Yeah, I mean, Which is what? well, what happens is after he says, Richie, yeah. right, we dissolve and what we see is the real Bob on the motorcycle coming up the hill where they ran up as kids. Like to reminisce. Yeah, and you see him as he really is now, wow. right? He dresses as a biker. Yeah. And we shot it. Yeah. We actually shot it. Yeah. But because Bob wasn't an actor, we couldn't really give him any lines, so all we're gonna do is just show the picture, right? Yeah. And we're gonna end the actual movie with with him talking to Richie at the top of the mountain, saying, it's over, bro. Your story's been told. And that's how it was gonna end, right? Wow, I got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. what happened? Why didn't that go in the we, movie? <laughs> what happened? Well, we actually tried, it didn't, it didn't work. It, it took us in another direction because the story wasn't about Bob. right? It's about, it's about Richie. And actually it was my youngest daughter who plays 
Richie's sister. In she's the, in the she's in the film, right? Yeah, she's yeah, she's the little girl in the motorcycle. Yeah, she was 11 years old. She got casted in the movie. Yeah. Uh, she came up with that. She goes, "No, you need to go back to La Bamba. Yeah. It has to end on a good note. We can't leave people with that pain in their in their heart." Right. So we cut in, boom, it happened. Do you still have those the the oh, that scene? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Remember I have to bother you for that. <laughs> I think um, just to wrap up, though, Daniel, let's stay. One of the things that why this why you and the story of Richie of Ricardo Valenzuela are so important to to Chicano history and, and and Latinos in general is that we are underrepresented, right? I feel like we're underrepresented. So uh, Ricardo Richie Val Valenzuela was like we said one of the first people to kind of break through mainstream media. Um, what are some of the things that you encountered coming up in Hollywood? And, and these things, as far as racism. Oh, um, very heavy, man. You know, when my first album was released, uh, I went to Tower Records in Los Angeles. They wanted to see how people were doing, right? And they had this sandwich sign out in front. It said, Daniel Valdez, no, no, no relation to Juan Valdez. Juan Valdez was a character they used to sell beans mm. for coffee. Yeah. And it was a commercial. Yeah. So there was the fact that they put that out there and my album was put in the international foreign section. Mm. You couldn't find my album. You had to look for it, you know. Yeah. So I, I started facing that right away, yeah. you know. I, I felt that, but I, I knew it was coming. Yeah. You know, when, when I sat with her Robert, he told Don't me, you. he said, listen, you know, we're going to do this, but you have to know what's going to happen. You know, uh, I don't know how people are going to accept you. He says, because you're, you're a face of, of a new generation that we need to recognize. Uh, and so I was a little bummed about some of the treatment I was getting because I wasn't getting the, the promotional backing that I wanted to have, you know. Uh, and ultimately, I ended up booking my, my own tour, right? The promotion tour for the album. Uh, the album only sold 175,000 copies. It was only out on the market for like 20 days. Mm. And, but it caught wind, what happened is that Chicanos identify, the movement was really strong. The Chicano movement was really strong. They picked up the album and became the, the theme song for Chicanos all over the country. The big walkout that took place uh, here in Boulder, where the Los Seis took place, and when they took over the university and they locked themselves up, well, the album Mestizo was become the battle the cry. Yeah. <laughs> that was the soundtrack to yeah. the movie. So, over the years, what's happened is the, the Mestizo is still selling, believe it or not, right. after all these years. I mean, it's got a following all of its own, you know. But I, I realized in Hollywood right away that uh, we had to carve our way in. Nobody was going to let us in. We had to come, we had to beat the door down, you know. Because right. we didn't want to come in through the back door. Right. You know, we wanted to see it for first front, you know. And I think it's important to, for, like you were saying, with, Edwards and, and yourself uh, that it got to the point where, okay, you guys aren't going to let us in, so we'll just create our own avenue. Exactly. We found our own, own audience. Source, right? That's right. what happened. And Latinos need to understand that in order for Hollywood to recognize who we are, they have to understand the validity, economic validity of our audience and the fact that our people are willing to spend money to not only go to the theater or to see the teatro, but to see movies. And you got movies now that are barely beginning to, to open the door, right? You got Blue Beetle is coming out, and the the high high mile uh, story of the astronaut, Chicano astronaut, that went up. It's beginning to happen, right? Uh, but it's taking years, yeah, man. The future is really important in terms of where yeah. we go from here, you know. Uh, now that we've got our door, our foot in the door, yeah. it's the question of what happens from here on out, and exactly. a lot of it has to do with the kind of stories that we tell. We need to focus on ourselves and we need to tell our own stories, create our own scripts and move into the medium. I mean, it's, it's like we have to learn how to make our own movies, cinematography, directing, screenplay writing. I mean, all of that is, I said it last night in, in the performance, you know, it starts with the writer. We have to encourage our own kind to be writers, screenplay writers, playwrights. Yeah. We can't do movies without writers. Exactly. And that's where it starts. And I mean, that's the good thing about some of the movies that are beginning to happen is they're beginning to realize that you, you have to have real Latino writers to start this thing. Exactly. We have to write our own stories. Exactly. And I think there's so much, uh, we, we had spoken about this prior, there's just so much talent in our neighborhoods, yeah. in, our, in, our, in our barrios, yeah. que 
that we have, I think there's this misconception that like, oh, they're, they're really good painters and they're really good uh, rappers or yeah. athletes, right? But we also forget there's amazing writers, yeah. este, pintores, there's a, there's a great thing. So when we create our stories, when we tell our stories, we have to cast our own people. Yeah. It has to be brown made per se, yeah. one from the, from the beginning to the end. Yeah. There's well, also a, a, a gender thing that's really important. You know? yeah. One of the things that's happening is you're getting a lot of female writers yeah. who are novelists now. And that's a very important step in terms of getting where we want to go. Exactly. Uh, I mean, we had a chance to work with people like Selma Hayek and uh, Eva Longoria. Uh, these are people who are already in the in industry who are trying to create an avenue for it to happen, you know. Uh, but we need that presence in Hollywood to recognize the fact that the, we have a generation of people that have not been seen yet. You haven't seen anything yet because the talent is so wide and so strong. We have to discover it. Okay. But the only way to do that is with vehicles. You need you need platforms in order to do it. What's your take on it? How do you feel now, hind hindsight, moving forward? And now that it is really popular to be Latino, now with your famous, mega famous artists like your Bad Bunnies and, you know, Shakira's and all that, like, what's your take on that now that, like, we are so... Now mainstream media is acknowledging us yeah. to being like this powerhouse economically and, yeah. and musically. Well, I think you know it, 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 one thing leads to another, right? Our success in the business of, of entertainment has to really pay off for our community, you know. And I've said this before, you know, we're just barely learning to support our own kind. And it starts with that, you know, we, the movies that are being made right now are being supported by our people, you know, and there, there are inklings of, of support to beginning to show the Black Panther movie, which showed that Mexican character in there that shows a glimpse of the future is really important. The final crawl of the movie is a rap song done in Nahuatl, you know, and it just blew me away to hear that. And I say, okay, there's a place. So. I think the future for us is continuing to evolve, but mainly important to recognize the fact that we have our own audience. And America is barely beginning to wake up to the fact that beyond just the curios of our, of our culture, our tacos and burritos, there's also a story of family and struggle and willing to sacrifice ourselves for the better and for the better of our children and the better of our future. And that's why it's really important to realize that art and community come together, they have to come together or else it's not gonna work. Right. So just to wrap up, Amanda, what, what's the importance and how do we keep our, our money in our communities? Well, I think the most important thing is to realize that one thing leads to another, right? Uh, we need to look at the fact that we can invest in supporting our artists, but we need to have those artists come back to the barrio and make that connection. It's really important that, it's easy to get lifted out of, out of reality. You know, Hollywood has a tendency, Hollywood. To, tendency to do that with our Latino artists. Once they're in that world, they become Hollywoodites and become divas and they fall into that nasty reality. And we need to understand that the connection between us and our artists are really important. You know, someone like Carlos Santana who, who, who understands that, you know, and I work with Carlos over the years. And one thing we have in common is the fact that we believe that all artists are indebted to the community and you have to stay connected. And so I think the future that lies ahead for us is to realize that we need to invest in ourselves. We need to invest in our movies. And then the money that comes from that, the, the, the re, 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 rewards that we get funnel back to the community. And we continue to inspire the next generation that's coming up. It's perfect. It's a beautiful way to end. Muchísimas gracias por tu tiempo. Gracias.